Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus Christ in His Second Coming. I'm your host, Spencer. Before getting into this episode, I want to apologize to the previous uh, for the previous version of this episode. I was trying out a new microphone, and it appears the audio is really bad for a lot of you. So I hope you can hear me better this time around. Also note that I am actually combining parts one and two into a single episode this time around. Um, and I just want to say thank you for all of the feedback and comments, even those calling me out on the audio. One, it helps me be aware of uh, what's really happening out there. Um, and I do also want to add one other quick note. Since the original version of this episode was posted, some critics have commented specifically on my use and inclusion of Isaiah 29. I have read those comments, and I plan to address them in a future episode. But for now, this version is simply a re-recording of the original with better audio and having parts one and two combined into one. So let's get into the recording, re-recording. I want to start off this episode by expressing gratitude. In our previous episode, I shared a personal goal of mine uh, for this channel to reach 100 subscribers by the end of January. At the time of episode six being published, the channel only had 17 subscribers. And in less than 12 hours, we jumped to over 100. And the growth continues. In fact, at this moment in time, we're already over 700 subscribers. Now, I don't know how to explain the overnight explosion. I don't do any ads or promotions of this channel, aside from telling people in my inner circle. Yet, somehow, the number of subscribers has dramatically increased. And I want to express a deep level of appreciation for all of our new subscribers. Welcome. And I hope you feel welcomed and continue to, to uh, enjoy this content and come back for more. So, given our sudden growth, it is time to set a new goal. This time... Let's aim for a thousand total subscribers by the end of January. Now, trends have kind of wavered a little bit since we originally posted uh, episode seven. Um, I'm hoping we can get to a thousand subscribers. It's looking like we can, but I do need your help to get there. So please, please, please share this channel with, with your friends and family and, and those in your close circle. Invite them and ask them to also subscribe so we can get to that 1,000 subscribers by the end of uh, January 31st. Today, this re-recording is happening on New Year's Day, January 1st, so we have 30 days to get, this, uh, to get to this goal. So please, I appreciate your help and support by sharing this and asking your friends, family, and others to subscribe as well. Now, I also want to take a moment and thank all of those that have taken their time to comment on the previous uh, six episodes and the, the original recording of episode seven. Uh, even those of you who have been critical about our content. Now, your input and perspective is appreciated and it is respected. What I do ask is for everyone to be civil and Christ-like in their comments, regardless if you are in support of or against this content. I simply ask everybody to respond how you would see the Savior respond. For those who claim to be representing the, quote, true Jesus, please comment respectfully, because that is how Christ treated his critics. For those in defense of these videos, I appreciate your support, and I also ask you to respond and comment with kindness and respect. Remember, President Russell M. Nelson recently asked us to be peacemakers. With all of this said, please do comment. By commenting, it shows YouTube that this video and others of our channel are interesting, and it helps these videos show up in people's feed. Your, your, your comments do not have to be long or extensive, and a simple thank you or interesting is enough to help this content grow. Now, one other thing I do also want to clarify, especially because of some of the, the, the comments made and, and, and criticism received thus far. First and foremost, just know I am just a man. And I want to be clear of that. I am not a formal or trained scholar. I'm not a seminary or an institute teacher. I'm not a prophet or an apostle. My efforts for this channel uh, for the moment are something that I simply do as a side project. It is not my full-time work. I do not spend all day every day studying these topics. Uh, in fact, I look very and rely very heavily on institute and other manuals put out by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as my guide as my source to how I present on these different topics. So if you're questioning about where I'm getting this information or why I take certain perspectives that I do, again, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I do rely on their um, manuals and guides uh, as my source to look to to help make sure that I am presenting this information 
um, in accordance and in alignment with with what they're doing. Um, I do not go through and try and expound upon. I just am simply trying to point you to those resources and to the that information because it does repl- res- uh, it does require you, the listener to go out and get your own testimony of this information, do your own scripture study, do your own fasting and prayer about it. Simply do not take my words at 100% for making decisions on these topics and building your testimony. I just hope that it inspires you, gets you to think about things in a slightly different way um, that could hopefully help you find the answers that you're you're looking for and, and help you build your own testimony. Um, I am just simply a man I, that is trying to do his best to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Part of being a disciple is to share the message and teachings of the gospel to the best of their understanding and knowledge. So what does that mean here? That means that I could very well make a mistake. I could make a statement or a comment out of simply not knowing the difference that could be wrong or inaccurate. This is where I'm going to ask for your forgiveness and grace Please understand that I have no ill intent or desire to share false or inaccurate teachings or perspective. There are a couple of things that I am doing to minimize these chances of making mistakes. First, as I said a minute ago, I'm simply quoting the scriptures and the words of modern day prophets and apostles. Two, I'm careful to avoid making decisive statements or interpretations. Instead, I'm just trying to present a new way of thinking and trying to pose questions to get you, the listener, to think about the topic or the idea. The point of this channel is to bring up different aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ and those teachings related to his upcoming second coming. I always encourage you, the listener, to ponder the words I'm sharing, to go and read the scriptures or quotes I'm sharing, and to follow up with your own pondering, fasting, and prayer to get your own personal revelation on the topic. With that in mind, today's episode, for some, is going to be one such topic that's going to seem a bit controversial and will require a genuine and humble heart to hear, ponder, and investigate. I do realize that there are some of you that won't do these things and will simply jump straight into the comments and condemn me and the message of this episode. I respect your right to share your thoughts and opinions and your right to claim to know everything. Again, I just ask that you be civil in the approach you take with your words. So... Let's dive into this topic, uh, to this episode's topic. We're going to discuss the fulfillment of one prophecy related to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The prophecy fulfilled I want to look at deeper is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. One commenter in a previous episode claimed that there is no biblical reference that supports the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and challenged me to show otherwise. Well, to those of you who are interested, let's take a look and see what Uh, what we find. And uh, in case you missed it, we did briefly touch on this in our third episode where we talked why we need to study the second coming. I'll include a link to that earlier episode for those who need to go back and watch. All right, pull open your Bible, turn to Isaiah 29. For those who would like to compare different Bible versions, check out Blue Letter Bible mobile app. This app allows you to pull up side by side two different uh, Bible versions at the same time. Uh, For this channel, we're going to use the King James Version. The KJV is the primary version that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints use in their study. And one other minor difference for those who are unfamiliar with the LDS printed version, there are chapter headings that summarize the key points of the chapter. And below the verses are footnote references to other related scripture found in any of the LDS standard works, including the Bible Dictionary and Topical Guide. With this in mind, let's dive into Isaiah 29, starting with the LDS chapter heading, which reads, quote, A people, the Nephites, will speak as a voice from the dust. The apostasy, restoration of the gospel, and coming forth of a sealed book, uh, the Book of Mormon, are foretold, compared to 2 Nephi 27. And I'm going to pause real quickly and actually interject one little new thought to this here. this is where critics are already start going crazy. It's important to understand that, that for Latter-day Saints, we are in, uh, importing this compared to 2 Nephi 27, partially because Nephi talks about or takes Isaiah 29 um, and more so Isaiah in general and applies it to his own people, um, to the Nephite people. And that's where 
the beginnings of this notion of Isaiah 29 speaking as a voice from the dust being about the Nephites um, comes actually more so from the premise of Nephi himself saying that that will happen from his own people as part of the Book of Mormon coming forth and that the Book of Mormon for his people um, will be that voice from the dust. Um, I am going to stop my the, the, the train of thought there uh, as to why Isaiah in general 29 is being used. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, I do want to dive deeper on this particular scripture and topic of Isaiah 29 being used as a voice from the dust in reference to the Book of Mormon, because I know um, other Christians don't agree with that perspective. And I respect that. And I'm wanting to do my due diligence to research it and understand it better from the LDS perspective so I can provide that that feedback uh, at a later date and time. All right. So as we see in this chapter header, it is speaking to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and it sets this perspective for the reader of Isaiah 29. Uh, there is even a recommendation to read 2 Nephi 27. Now, in this episode specifically, we actually won't look at chapter 27. We're going to look at a different chapter in 2 Nephi. So make sure you stick around to see which one we review. For those critics, I can already hear you talking about this, about the verses in the Book of Mormon prophesying its own purpose as being a bit self-fulfilling. And to be fair, I get that argument and perspective. So when we go over any Book of Mormon scriptures, it will mostly be for the benefit of our LDS listeners and those who are open-minded to the reality that the Book of Mormon isn't a man-made creation of fiction, but it's actually a historical text, just as the Bible is a historical text. For now, though, let's put that argument aside, read the actual verses to see what they say, and we're going to go ahead and start with verse 4, which reads, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. The question I have to those of you watching and listening, what does it mean when the scriptures use the term out of the dust? Share in the comments below your understanding of this phrase. According to one Bible scholar, Dr. Kerry Muelstein, he shares how Isaiah's words are meant for us to listen to and acknowledge the voices or teachings of our own ancestors. This is part of taking the scriptures and applying them to ourselves. What are the words that our ancestors have shared for us to be able to avoid making their mistakes in our own lives? So we should be looking to those that have gone before us and learn from them. All right, jumping down to verse 11 and, uh, and 12. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Now, I do actually have a quick question for those listening who uh, who are not of the LDS faith, who are of other Christian denominations. Who is it that Isaiah is talking about when he uses this phrase, him that is not learned? I'm curious to hear what you've been taught in your interpretation of this particular reference to a him that is not learned. For the LDS, this is where we start to see a direct correlation to Joseph Smith. At the time of translating the Book of Mormon, he was in his early 20s with a fifth grade level education. Um, and that language that was used in the Book of Mormon and on the gold plates was a dead language. It was what's called Reformed Egyptian. And so with a fifth grade level of education, he somehow had the ability to translate a dead language into English. Not something that comes uh, without uh, direct uh, intervention from the Lord. This exact phrase, I cannot for it is sealed, actually came to fulfillment when Joseph Smith was in the early stages of translating the Book of Mormon. The story goes as follows out of the Joseph Smith history, um, which is only one chapter long, but it is lengthy. And so down in verses 63 and six, through 65, uh, we read the following. Quote, sometime in this month of February, the aforementioned Mr. Martin Harris came to our place got the characters which I had drawn off the plates and started with them to the city of New York. 
For what took place relative to him and the characters, I refer to his own account of the circumstances as he related them to me after his return, which was as follows. I, meaning Martin Harris, went to the city of New York and presented the characters which had been translated with the translation thereof to Professor Charles Anthon, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anthon stated that the translation was correct, more so than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. I then showed him those which were not yet translated, and he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic, and he said they were true characters. He gave me a certificate certifying to the people of Palmyra that they were true characters, and that the translation of such of them as had been translated was also correct. I took the certificate and put it into my pocket, and was just leaving the house when Mr. Anthon called me back and asked me how the young man found out that there were gold plates in the place where he found them. I answered that an angel of God had revealed it to him. He then said to me, let me see that certificate. I accordingly took it out of my pocket and gave it to him. When he took it and tore it to pieces, saying that there was no such thing now as ministering of angels, and that if I would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. I informed him that part of the plates were sealed and that I was forbidden to bring them. He replied, I cannot read a sealed book. I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell, who sanctioned what Professor Anton had said respecting both the characters and the translation. End quote. All right. I'm curious to hear from you, your thoughts about this history from Martin Harris. I personally find it interesting that as soon as Professor Anthon heard about an example of modern-day ministering of angels, which he himself could not understand or agree with, he decided to retract the certificate. Which this just goes to make a point. Just because we can't make sense of the things of God and his way of doing things doesn't negate his work. All right, going back to Isaiah 29, picking up in verse 13, where it reads, quote, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Joseph was one who had drawn near to God. He spent his childhood reading and being taught from the Bible. He spent a considerable amount of time pondering the words of the Bible, and in doing so humbled and tuned his spirit to be able to and willing to receive personal revelation. And that eventually manifests itself in the first vision. Let us use Joseph's example as a template for our lives as being able to receive personal revelation. Okay, continuing on to verse 14. Quote, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Jumping down to verse 18. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Here in Isaiah 29, we learn about a book with voices from the dust, which will be part of a marvelous work and a wonder that will bring the blind and deaf out of obscurity and darkness. I'm curious to hear from our non-LDS listeners to comment below what they've been taught as to the way of interpreting these words of Isaiah. Now, I get that this one reference may not seem conclusive that Isaiah was talking about the Book of Mormon. So let's take a look at another biblical reference. We're going to jump over to Ezekiel 37, and we're going to read verses 16 through 17, uh, which read, Moreover, thou, son of man, take thee one stick and ride upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and ride upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall be in thy and shall become one in thy hand. Continuing on with verses eighteen and nineteen, quote. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show unto us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, 
and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. This phrasing of bringing the two sticks together visualizes the perspective which Latter-day Saints take with regards to both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. We do not see it as one or the other. We do not see the Book of Mormon as a replacement to the Bible. We see them together. They go together and complement each other. They fill in spiritual gaps, if you will. Pause for a second and think of all that would be lost if the Bible were to go away and we only had the Book of Mormon. We'd lose out on all the precious history of Israel and the covenants the Lord made with that people. We'd lose the direct teachings of the Savior, including those such as the Beatitudes and the Olivet Discourse. So no, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints do not want to lose or give up the Bible. In contrast, the Book of Mormon does have many additional teachings and prophecies that the Bible doesn't have. It fills in some gaps and proves even more a holistic view of the plan of salvation and who Jesus Christ is. The Book of Mormon expands upon the doctrines of Christ, gospel principles, and we see examples of application. Some of these doctrines and principles include his name and his church, the need for his true church to be built upon his gospel. We learn about ordinances in greater detail, and on and on and on. Additionally, it's a bit ironic that one of the two sticks is that, uh, is that of Joseph, meaning Joseph of Egypt. And yet the Book of Mormon was translated by a young man who was also named Joseph. <clears throat> Coincidence? Maybe. So why then does this scripture matter? Well, the Book of Mormon, it starts off with a record of a family that left Jerusalem, approximately 600 BC. That's right, a group of Jews, dependents of Israel, that left, or in other words, broke off from the main branch and eventually ended up in a new world. In chapter 5 of 1 Nephi, verses 14 through 16, we learn that this break-off family are descendants of Joseph of Egypt. So the entire Book of Mormon is a collection of historical writings of a break-off branch of Israel that come from the lineage of Joseph, one of the twelve tribes of Israel. All right, now I get it that these two Bible scriptures aren't enough to prove the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Thank goodness there aren't any more. Or are there? What about Psalms 85.11? Truth shall spring out of the earth. Well, the Book of Mormon was buried and hid in a hillside under a large stone for approximately 1,400 years. So there's that visual clue. John 10.16. You then have in the New Testament, Jesus himself talking about having other sheep that are not of this fold. Which makes sense why in the Book of Mormon, 3 Nephi chapter 11, you have the account of the resurrected Jesus Christ coming to visit the people who were still entitled to the promised blessings of Israel, even though they're a breakoff group. So for those skeptics wanting a biblical verse as evidences hinting to or describing the coming forth of Book of Mormon, I've given a few for you to consider. And if these aren't good enough, I ask, what will be enough in order for you to believe? Now, for this next part, I'm going to turn to the Book of Mormon, and there are a few different areas that I could reference, but I want to focus on one chapter specifically. 2 Nephi 29 is where we'll be reading from next. In this chapter, we have the original prophet Nephi sharing a revelation from the Lord. The entire chapter is worth the read and essentially addresses the fundamental debate I've heard from skeptics, and that is that we don't need the Book of Mormon simply because we have the Bible. The Bible is complete and perfect as it stands, and anything other than Bible is essentially blasphemy. To those who argue against any additional scripture, let's learn from the Lord directly. Starting in verse 1, we learn that the Lord will do a marvelous work among the Gentiles, and that he will set his hand a second time to recover his people, those of the house of Israel. Understand, the Book of Mormon exists to aid the Lord in his efforts to recover his covenant people. The Book of Mormon exists because the Lord loves all of his children and keeps his covenants. In verse 3 we read, quote, Because my word shall hiss forth, many of the Gentiles shall say, A Bible, a Bible, we have got a Bible, and there cannot be any more Bible. 
Does this not sound like some of the critics of the Bible of the Book of Mormon? Sounds like it to me. In fact, I, there's been multiple times I've heard this exact phrase: "A Bible? We've got a Bible. There is no more need for a Bible, for any more Bible." Verse four. This is the Lord's response to those who argue that we don't need anything beyond the Bible. The Lord says, quote, But thus saith the Lord God, O fools, they shall have a Bible, and it shall proceed forth from the Jews, mine ancient covenant people. Verse 6, Thou fool that shall say a Bible, we've got a Bible, and we need no more Bible. Verse 7, Know ye not that there are more nations than one? Know ye not that I, the Lord your God, have created all men, and that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, and I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth? Let me pause right there. Since the Lord created more than just one nation, doesn't it seem right then that those other nations would have their own writings and prophetic teachings? especially at a time in the history of the world where communications and interactions were largely restricted to geographic regions, it starts to make sense why an entire group of people would have their own writings. And quite honestly, it seems a bit arrogant for anybody to try and argue that all other nations would not have or even think about God or a God and therefore write down their own experiences of trying to come to know God and any sort of teachings that may have come as a result of that effort. Now, I want to invite those of you who are still listening to drop down into the comments and share your response to the idea that the Lord would have multiple nations write down their own experiences and teachings. All right, going back to 2 Nephi 29, picking up in verse 8, reads, Wherefore murmur ye because that ye shall receive more of my word? The Lord's asking, why are you complaining if I'm giving you more scripture? Why is that such a big deal? The Lord continues, Know ye not that the testimony of two nations is a witness unto you that I am God, that I remember one nation like unto another? Wherefore, I speak the same words unto one nation like unto another. And when the two nations shall run together, the testimony of the two nations shall run together also. Verse 9, And I do this that I may prove unto many that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that I speak forth my words according to mine own pleasure. And because that I have spoken one word, ye need not suppose that I cannot speak another. For my work is not yet finished, neither shall it be until the end of man, neither from the time henceforth and forever. Verse 10, Wherefore, because that ye have a Bible, ye need not suppose it contains all of my words. Neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. Verse 11. For I command all men, both in the east and in the west and in the north and in the south and in the islands of the sea, that they shall write the words which I speak unto them. For out of the books which shall be written, I will judge the world, every man according to their works, according to that which is written. Verse 12. For behold, I shall speak unto the Jews, and they shall write it. And I shall also speak unto the Nephites, and they shall write it. And I shall also speak unto the other tribes of the house of Israel, which I have led away, and they shall write it. And I shall also speak unto all nations of the earth, and they shall write it. It seems the Lord has provided clarification to those who try to rebut the need and legitimacy for the Book of Mormon. And I understand that despite this episode, many of our critics won't change their perspective. To those remaining cr critics, I say again that I respect your perspective. Feel free to comment below with your thoughts. Just be civil about it. For the rest of you, I hope we've helped provide clarity on this topic of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and playing a part in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Feel free to also drop down to the comments and share your thoughts. Are there any other scriptures in the Bible that I missed that talk about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon? Make sure to comment below. Include your reference. Thank you again for listening to this episode. I apologize for the original version with the audio. Hopefully this time around you were able to hear me better uh, and enjoy this video. Make sure to comment and share this episode. If you haven't done so already, we'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe to our channel so you can make be made aware of our upcoming episodes. That'll do it this time, and we'll see you next time.